Back in 1980, the silver price was 1 20th the price of the Dow Jones. So if we return to that ratio again, that would mean physical silver outperforms general equities by a factor of just over 50 from current levels. As crazy as that may sound, I would almost be embarrassed to say that if it weren't right here in the data and if it hadn't happened before. What I'm going to talk to you guys about today is how to build a silver portfolio, how to structure it. And I, I see the same mistakes over and over again, especially by new investors, and I know because I've made them. So we're, we're going to talk about six wisdom keys for structuring a silver mining portfolio. And it's probably not what you think. Wh whenever you think about building a silver mining stock portfolio and you're new, most people say, all right, well, what stock, what stock should I buy? That's the first question they ask themselves. Well, there's some steps I think that we should look at before that, and I think this is going to especially apply to the people who are just building their portfolios now. And by the way, I think you're doing so at a very good time. So the, the first thing, I, th I think it can't just be about the money. There has to be a why behind what, investing in these sectors. If you asked me five years ago, why are you doing this? I would say, well, I'm trying to make a bunch of money. Well, what are you going to do with it? There has to be a means to an end. So you need to have a why. At Silver Chartist, I like to say our mission is time freedom to pursue life's higher callings, things of eternal significance. That's why I'm doing this. I want time freedom. <clears throat> this is my why. I want more time with my kids. It's not just to make more money. I want to be able to stay home and help my uh, wife homeschool. So I think having a why and having a deep fundamental conviction in why we're in this sector will kind of help you ride out the volatility like we've seen. <clears throat> Number two is proper position sizing. I think when a lot of people learn about the silver story and what's going on in our financial system, they say, well, I got to sell everything and just go all into silver. That's what I did. Um, that may or may not be right for you, but it, it's something to think about. How much I, th I think about a whole financial pie, and the first question we should ask ourselves is, what section, wh what percentage of that pie do we want to allocate to these sectors? I don't, I don't hear a lot of new investors talking about that. It's really important. If you're over allocated or on leverage, and then we get these sharp sell offs, you can be driven to sell at the exact wrong time. So you want to think how much, how much of your total portfolio do you want to put into these sectors? Third is portfolio structure. A big mistake I see is new investors going all in on explorers and developers. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you know what you're doing. It, you, you've assessed the risk reward of doing that. But you know, a, lo a lot of new investors are drawn to the 100 bagger potential and they buy all penny stocks. A lot of people also don't think about jurisdictional diversification. Um, and we'll talk about those. So th this is how I think about it. This is kind of the risk structure here. I'm a strong advocate for owning physical silver first stored outside of the banking system. Then, coming down the risk curve, you can look at the exchange-traded funds. I think you can greatly outperform the ETFs with a well-selected basket of individual mining stocks, but that may not be for everyone. You know, I, I've talked to retirees who are, you know, let's say in their 70s, and they don't have time to keep up with company news or anything like that. There's nothing wrong with the ETFs. Personally, I build my core portfolio around royalty and streaming companies. To me, these present the most favorable risk reward setup. They're not as sexy. I gotta stop doing that. <laughs> They're not as sexy. They're probably not gonna be 10 or 20 or 30 baggers, but I think it's a relatively safe way to get a five or 10 bagger over the course of this bull market. So don't overlook the royalty and streaming companies. Then you've got the senior producers, the junior producers, and of course the developers and explorers. I personally put about 25. That's the last time I'm gonna do that. <laughs> I put about 25% of my overall portfolio into that category. So yeah, personally I put 25% of my precious metals portfolio into explorers and developers. That, that's not a one size fits all answer, but that was, that's what's right for me. We're talking about portfolio structure. So the first question is, how do you want to structure your portfolio? Common mistake, too heavily weighted into the explorers and developers. Nothing wrong with that as long as you know the risk you're taking. A lot of those explorers and developers are down 80, 90% from last August. I know a lot of new people that just came into the sector last August, and now they're down 80% and they're all in. And uh, they're throwing in the towel saying, this isn't for me. If had they thought about these questions first, I don't think they would be doing that. Portfolio structure. Next one is jurisdictional diversification. 
A lot of us here, we're, we, I want primarily silver miners right now at this stage of the cycle. As the bull market matures, I plan to swap some silver miners for gold miners as that gold to silver ratio uh, compresses. But I like to look, break the whole precious metals complex down into six subsectors. So you've got physical gold, physical silver, senior gold miners, senior silver miners, junior gold miners, junior silver miners. Six sectors or subcomponents. Of those six subcomponents right now, it's the junior silver miners that are the most undervalued of the whole precious metals complex if you've got a one to three year time horizon. A challenge is the majority, or close to a majority, of primary silver mining stocks are in Mexico. So we don't necessarily want to put all our eggs in that one basket. So uh, something to think about is jurisdictional diversification. You know, we want, to, we want to be spread out. It's easily overlooked. And then finally, this is where most people start, individual stock selection. <laughs> this is where everyone wants to start. Now, unless you're, you've dedicated some time into how to evaluate mining stocks, you know, it's not like your typical general equities. Uh, obviously, it's much more complicated than that. It requires a special skill set. And if you're brand new and you try and do that on your own, you're probably going to have some problems. And, you know, th three people right there who I've been looking to for over 10 years now, these are my go-tos for stock selection. Jeff Clark, he's a contributor to silverchartist.com. Lobo Tigre, who's in the back, I've been following him for, uh, gosh, over 10 years now, and he's just a wealth of information. And then, of course, David Morgan. Those are my three go-tos for stock selection. Yeah, go ahead. I noticed, uh, Rick um, I just noticed he was on the list. Not a show. Yeah, I mean, there's people I like, but... Um, Any thoughts on this? General thoughts? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll say a couple thoughts. Um, Rick Rule, I really respect him, love his, um, his outlook to investing. But one thing I do see, like the Rick Rules and Eric Sprott's of the world who have been tremendously successful, right? A lot of new people, again, this is another mistake, and I'm glad you brought this up, they say, oh, Eric Sprott bought, the, bought this stock. Rick Rule bought this stock. I should buy it too. Well, they, you don't know when they bought it. You don't know what their entry price is. And they're not, you're not paying them, so they're, they're not going to tell you when they sell. They might tell you after they sold. So, <laughs> and, and they're honest about that. There's nothing wrong with that. But. The fifth key here to building a silver portfolio is having a strategy to accumulating. There's no right or wrong strategy, but a lot of people don't put any thought whatsoever into this. They say, all right, I got this, let's say $10,000. I picked out my stocks, buy them. Three common strategies are one, you can just dollar cost average. You can scale in over time. Just say, I'm gonna, on the 15th of every month, I'm gonna put $1,000 in. That's one strategy. You could scale in on weakness at logical support levels. That's kind of what we specialize in at Silver Chartist. We use technical analysis to find logical support levels to gradually scale in over time. Or third, you could buy technical breakouts. As contrarians, most of us here are contrarians, right? We don't like to buy things that are going up. We like to buy things that are going down. I don't personally do this unless I'm short-term trading, but some of the smartest people on Wall Street, they buy things that are going up. They buy breakouts. So there's no right or wrong here, but it's important to have a strategy. Think through how are you going to accumulate your positions. The idea of, these are my stocks, here's my money, buy right now. That's, that's probably not the best strategy. And then finally, having a well-defined exit strategy. <clears throat> Mine is written out. I write it out, I wrote it in pencil. I give myself the <laughs> leeway to change it. But I, at least I have something, it's a plan. So uh, rather than go through the details of my personal plan, I'll just tell you some thoughts I have. Personally, I think as silver reaches $50 and surpasses 50, the government and jurisdictional risk associated with mining stocks is just gonna escalate. So I plan to scale out early. And by the way, I think silver is gonna to go to probably $300 sometime later this decade. Um, I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. So you may say, well, why are you gonna sell your mining stocks at 50? It's risk management and I wanna scale out um, into strength. And by the way, I'm not going to sell all of my mining stocks at $50 silver, but that's when I'm going to start taking some off the table while keeping some in uh, to ride out the majority of the bull market. I like to say whenever you push the buy button, have a plan to, sub <laughs> have a plan to subsequently push that sell button. I think what I found is buying is much easier than selling. Taking those profits is not easy. After $50 silver, my, my personal exit strategy is based on historical ratios. You can look at Dow Gold ratios. You can look at um, 
uh, uh, gold to real estate ratios. There's a lot of ratios I'm going to use for my personal exit strategy. <clears throat> so those are the six keys that I came up with that are easily overlooked when it comes to building a mining stock portfolio. I put a couple of charts together that we can um, that I'll be watching closely over the next few months. So I titled this one, Gold is Undervalued Relative to Stocks. So if you look at the previous bull market, the Dow Jones bottomed at about 850. Where did gold peak? 850. That's a one-one ratio. And that ratio was reached for maybe a day or two, if not shorter. But I think that is a reasonable target for where we're headed. And if we return to that ratio, that means gold would outperform stocks or general equities by a factor of 20 from current levels. And when you overlay that on a chart right here, you see two patterns. You see that triangle pattern right there? And the silver chartist members know triangle patterns are one of my favorite patterns to watch because they give us key levels to watch. So what I'd be watching for here is an upside breakout above that red line right there. And that would signal that gold is going to start outperforming stocks. And that's what we need to see. We need to see those general equity investors start you know, liquidating their stocks and coming into gold. We need gold to start outperforming the stock market. And that will be a key signal that we're resuming the bull market. So if gold is undervalued relative to the stock market, silver is even more undervalued. This is actually a Dow-Silver ratio. The other one was a uh, gold-Dow ratio, so it's kind of inverted here. But back in 1980, the silver price was 1 20th the price of the Dow Jones. So if we return to that ratio again, that would mean physical silver outperforms general equities by a factor of just over 50 from current levels. As crazy as that may sound, I would almost be embarrassed to say that if it weren't right here in the data and if it hadn't happened before. Is it going to happen again? I think there's a very good chance it will. There's obviously no guarantees. So here's five precious metal stocks that I feel like are at favorable long-term entry points. Full disclosure, I own these stocks. They're, uh, they're not explorers and developers. Um, the first one here, and of course, I always have to give the disclaimer, I'm not a financial advisor. Always do your own due diligence. Please never take anything I say as advice. <laughs> Sandstorm Gold is one of my favorite royalty and streaming companies. This is a bullish arc pattern that's forming along with a double bottom just around that $6 level. So it's going to be critical that Sandstorm Gold holds this support. If we fail here, that could lead to another uh, sharp decline. A lot of purely technical traders are watching this chart right now, and they're watching that $6 level. Six dollars fail, there could be a little bit more downside. However, we're extremely oversold right against support. So from a technical perspective, that's a statistically optimal place to accumulate. I wouldn't go all in right here, but if I didn't have a position, I had some cash, this might be a good place to consider scaling in. Another one I really like is Wheaton Precious Metals. This is a blue chip royalty and streaming company. They pioneered the streaming model. And this one, again, is oversold. It's sitting right at that key support level, right around $35. I feel like this one is a very good value proposition at this level. Probably not going to be a 10-bagger, but this is one you know, I'd feel good about putting my grandma in. And then another royalty and streaming company I like is Metalla Royalty. Um, this is actually th this is an ugly chart. This one is beaten down. <laughs> I would have thought that $7.30 level would hold as support. It broke down, but what's forming on the chart here, they call that a bullish descending wedge. And as price compresses, once you get a break above that red line right there, there's a statistically likely chance that you're going to get a, a nice rally. So uh, Metal Royalty is another one I'm looking at. Another one is First Majestic Silver. You've heard uh, Jeff talk about this one the other day. I think Jeff said it's one of his favorite silver miners. It is mine as well. Uh, oversold right at key support, approaching the apex of this triangle pattern. And then finally, um, this one's a little bit more speculative, but Liberty Gold, it's just so oversold that um, I figured I would show this one. This, this is one that I'm personally accumulating. All right, guys, thank, thank you so much. And uh, by the way, I, I wanted to say this in the beginning. It's just uh, I wanted to thank uh, Stock Pulse and uh, all the folks for allowing me to speak here. And uh, just an honor to, to be able to speak and share stage with people like, uh, you know, Lobo and David Morgan and Jeff Clark. And um, just uh, it's been a great time. And thank you, guys. Appreciate you. And I'll talk to you soon. Thank you.